So thank you, firstly, to Zulfi for starting this amazing effort. Thank you to uh, Gates Foundation for funding our meetings, and thank you to WHO and UNICEF and USAID for jumping on board, and thank you to Lancet for uh, taking this up and publishing it and uh, disseminating it. So, the concluding part of pretty much every Lancet series has been uh, defining research priorities for the future after all this evidence has been systematically and critically analyzed. And defining research priorities is actually a grim and risky and dangerous job, and I wouldn't recommend it to anyone really. You, <laughs> it's, uh, you have to deal with three major and 17 minor issues at least, and I'm just going to mention the major ones. Firstly, the spectrum of research ideas is infinite, it's, it's endless, it's only limited by the imagination of all living scientists. So how do you capture all these ideas and give them fair uh, treatment? Uh, secondly, uh, the health research in itself inherently is uncertain. Uh, you can't predict what the outcome will be. So, you know, how do you deal with this? How do you know which uh, uh, health research is going to lead to spectacular discoveries and which health research is not? And thirdly, the researchers themselves seems to be the big problem too because for some reason um, they seem to have these strong opinions and ideas about something that they think is really good. And then it's very difficult to uh, make them think that actually somebody else has a better idea and that they usually think for some reason that their idea is much better and smarter than everybody else's. So how do you get them all to agree that, uh, you know, to, to come up with a set of joint uh, priorities? These are remarkable uh, problems and there are 17 smaller ones as well. So some years ago, a group of us set out to, to a mission to, to try to work out some process that could at least uh, give us something that, that, that works, that can be reasonably acceptable. It's now known as the Chunri methodology. How did it all start? Well, the World Bank provided some funding to the Global Forum for Health Research, which then funded the Child Health and Nutrition Research Initiative, a group of about 20 of us who were from all sorts of backgrounds, from ethicists, lawyers, researchers, public health workers, uh, policy makers, uh, fundamental scientists, and so on. So we were gathering and we started gathering in 2005 and we were meeting and we were meeting and, and then we were meeting some more and <laughs> at all these lovely places and uh, eventually we did come up with, with, a, with a strategy, we, we did come up with a methodology but it took a lot of time to, to develop something that, that's working. We really tried to, to, to you know, wrestle with so many problems. So the first problem is dealing with infinity. How do you do it? I mean, mathematicians can do it, physicians, uh, physicists can do it. So what we realized is that actually, although the spectrum of research ideas is infinite, uh, we realized that every single research idea will fall into one of the four most fundamental research instruments. I have a lovely set of slides to demonstrate that this is actually uh, true, but in interest of time, I'm not showing them now. But these research instruments we call the description, delivery, development, and discovery. Now, these fundamental research instruments branch into something we call research avenues. I'm showing about 11 of them here. There are more of them. And then these research avenues further branch into something that we can we, we call research options. Those are some feasible five-year research projects that can be done uh, given the research capacity out there and technologies of our time. So these research options, although they, they are not endless, there are, there are many hundreds of them, but they're not an endless spectrum. And then those branch into endless spectrum of research questions. So we realize that although we can't deal with the infinity of the research questions and ideas, actually we can maybe uh, stop there at the level of research options and then uh, assemble a few uh, hundreds of them and this will give us a very reasonable coverage of all sorts of ideas and make us reasonably confident that we're not missing out on anything too important. So that, that kind of solved the problem of infinite number of questions. Now, how do you solve the problem of uncertainty of what comes out of health research? Well, this was linked to trying to develop some criteria for prioritization because when you have these long lists of research options, how do you discriminate which is a greater priority and which is a lesser priority? 
Well, we developed this very simple framework of what the health research should be. It should, it's a process that should start with a research question, which then generates some new knowledge. But then this new knowledge should actually get translated and implemented in order to reduce the re burden of disease. Otherwise, it's not a health research. It's a research, but not health research. Health research should eventually have a vision of reducing the burden of disease. This sounds obvious, but actually, the criteria that are being used at the moment for funding health research and investing in health research is these. If the generated new knowledge from answering the research question is novel, attractive, it gets published in high impact journals, it gets a lot of media coverage, it gets some lobbying behind it, what happens is the money is immediately given to the researchers to go back and open further research questions. In this way, we're getting trapped into an endless endless fundamental basic science and all scientists working towards expanding the, the boundaries towards the unknown without ever fulfilling the potential of this generating new knowledge to actually, you know, being translated and the, uh, reduced burden of disease. And what's the most remarkable is that the governmental funding is trapped in this vicious cycle. The NIH and MRC are only recently, you know, beginning their shift and large move towards realizing that this is what they've been doing doing all along. And if their interest is to reduce the burden of disease of their populations, then they should actually balance a lot better the research that is fundamental and generating knowledge with the research which is translating that knowledge into something that is going to reduce the burden of disease. Strangely enough, it's the industry that was funding the translation mainly rather than the governments. And uh, uh, the research projects that were offering to translate or to improve the existing interventions were were considered boring and uh, usually they were rejected by MRC and NIH. Now things are changing finally. So at Chandra we realized that although we can't say what uh, research is going to lead to something and what research is not going to lead to something, at least we can understand the components of this uncertainty and the components are getting from research question to generating new knowledge, something needs to be answerable in an ethical way. To get from generating new knowledge to translation, something needs to be shown to be effective. To getting from translation and implementation to the actual disease burden reduction, we need to have something that's also going to be deliverable and affordable in almost the population. And then even once you get to the reduction of burden of disease, this reduction can be large or small. So some research can have bigger potential to reduce burden of disease or much smaller. And finally, even this reduction may be more equitably distributed across the population or more inequitably. It may only be in the wealthy in the society. So we decided to set these, uh, these five criteria as a standard criteria for discriminating among research priorities. If something was more likely to be answerable, effective, affordable, had larger potential to reduce disease burden, and worked more equitably, then this was obviously a greater priority among all the other ideas than some other idea. So we were very happy when we got to this point. It seemed like we worked out the problem of infinite number of research questions and that we worked out the problem of, you know, predicting uncertainty of certain options and actually prioritizing them based on uh, more likelihood towards fulfilling these things. But then we realized that there is a peculiar thing about prioritizing uh, research because we, we miss several other dimensions that we didn't think of. Namely, if you're trying to answer whether a research question is eff effective or deliverable, you are depending big time on who is funding and wanting to invest in health research and what is your context. Let me explain. So, if you are working for the government and the government wants to invest in health research, their motivation may be to try to reduce the burden of disease across the board. If industry is investing in health research, they're not that interested in reducing the burden of disease across the world. They're more interested in maybe generating patents because they're industry and they want to make profit. That's their primary goal. If you're the Gates Foundation or some other uh, philanthropic foundation, they may not care about uh, uh, just uh, burden of disease across the board or certainly not the profit. They may care about just getting uh, some problem solved like polio or malaria or something and uh, this will eventually really get us the prize. 
then the style of investing is going to differ between different uh, investors. Government should take a sensible, responsible, balanced style, whether uh, industry is always going to be risk averting, whether the foundations uh, can actually be risk seeking, they can afford to be. Uh, the population of interest, are you talking about global or regional or national or subnational or specific groups of children? And then are you focusing on all burden of disease or just a specific disease or even trying to develop a specific product? And finally, time frame. Strangely, time is maybe the most important dimension of them all because it's completely different research priorities are going to come up on top if your time window and vision is short term versus mid term versus very, very long term. You can see that there's going to be a complete shift because usually it is the new downstream research, novel interventions that have much bigger potential over a longer period of time, but over a shorter period of time they're entirely unrealistic. So now we are left with another problem and what to do about the researchers themselves, how to make them all accept some common joint list of research priorities which is no, not their own personal ideas. So we, we decided to just remove the individuals out of the picture because there are many opinionated, loud individuals out there who always get it their way on these expert meetings and panels and so on. And we wanted to get rid of them. So how to do that? Well, we you know, turned to the concept of the wisdom of crowds. So we decided that we're going to give all ideas to many, many, many experts all over the world. We're looking at the most productive people uh, in the last five years and usually send these ideas uh, to 200 or 300 of the most productive of them because they are realistically the people who know most about the area and who will be the beneficiaries and the users of the research funding in the next five years. So it's reasonable to ask them to score and to propose the ideas themselves. So once you get 100 people involved in this, then everybody can individually only contribute 1% to the overall score. And this is what we're doing now. We're trying to capture collective optimism of many, many people towards each and every proposed idea in a very structured way. And then their optimism is scaled from 0 to 100 eventually, once this is all uh, taken into account. And this, is, this gives us the priority scores and uh, transparent and intuitive results and the democratic process. So we still do get an answer, but not from one or 12 people influenced by one person, but from 100 people working completely independently. And we do get an answer, but it, it's not owned by anyone. And finally, this is the methodology that we've developed, the Chunri methodology. It's a process that prioritizes a large number of competing ideas using a defined context, transparent criteria, and collective wisdom. It starts with the investors, which in case of pneumonia and diarrhea exercise, were the DGAP and the Gates and the WHO, US 8 and the UNICEF, and they define the context and criteria and expectations. Then the whole process is handed to technical experts who uh, try to give many, many ideas uh, according to this structured framework. They list the ideas and they apply those criteria to score them. Finally, it's all being brought back to even the wider group of stakeholders who can actually say, okay, we don't understand enough to list the research options or to score them, but we can say that in our society, equity is more important criteria than answerability. So in South Africa, they wanted equity scored or weighted double than all the other criteria. In the um, United States, they wanted effectiveness, they wanted the, or, or maximum potential for disease burden reduction. Some industry didn't want uh, to fund anything that is not answerable, at least 60 or 70 percent. So different stakeholders can, can twist these criteria and then twist the scores. And it's all given back to the investors and then they can decide what they want to do. Now, since we've developed this, it's been implemented uh, time after time after time. I've counted last night 39 papers based on secondary methodology, and many of them in decent uh, journals such as Lancet. And um, eventually, <laughs> yes, but anyway, and plus medicine too. Uh, well, anyway, um, uh, yes, now obviously Chenry is becoming seen as, as the solution to health research prioritization slowly. And uh, what's, what's particularly rewarding is that eight of these exercises have been published without any involvement from the people who actually developed the general methodology. So this is obviously taken up even without our help. There are at least 25 more exercises that I'm aware of going on at the moment. So this is all good. 
Now, um, the methods for pneumonia and diarrhea research priority setting uh, for this particular exercise is for pneumonia, uh, we managed to get 45 leading researchers on childhood pneumonia who agreed to take part, and they suggested more than 500 research ideas, which we merged into 158 research questions. For diarrhea, the process was even more advanced because it happened a couple of years later. There was a strategic advisory group who set up 10 target subgroups, eventually inviting 120 experts who suggested more than 2,000 research ideas, which were eventually merged into 466 research questions. So the context was defined for pneumonia as mortality and low and middle income countries and results expected until 2015. For diarrhea as both mortality and morbidity, low and middle income countries, and then results expected a bit mid-term until 2035. The criteria were standard generic criteria for discriminating uh, more and less prioritizing options, which is answerability, effectiveness, deliverability, burden reduction potential, and equity. So finally, out of 156 ideas, these are the top 10 as decided by the community of 45 research experts. You can see that most of them are from delivery uh, kind of research, some of them are from description kind of research, and some of them from development kind of research. None of them are from discovery type of research, and this is not surprising because the time scale was until 2015, and that was too short for any, uh, del uh, you know, any discovery research to really uh, make uh, an impact by that time. So uh, you can see, I'm just going to read the first three, but I'm going to get back to this in my last slide. So the first uh, ones were the studying the main barriers to care seeking and healthcare access for children with pneumonia in low resource settings. Also identifying the key risk factors predisposing to development of severe episodes, and then studying the main barriers to increase coverage by available vaccines, and also whether the... Oh, yes, a couple of minutes, because we've... You've Almost done. Yeah, okay. okay, sorry. And for diarrhea, the top three were ORS and zinc, uh, ensuring that they're delivered to the poorest, hard to reach populations. Then what are the barriers against the appropriate use of ORT and what drives care seeking behavior? We didn't want to completely discriminate against the discovery research, so we did a separate exercise for both pneumonia and diarrhea uh, using a bit different framework, trying to also give them a fair chance, and these are the ones that came on top. For pneumonia, low-cost polysaccharide conjugate vaccines, non-liquid pediatric antibiotic formulations, and common protein vaccine um, uh, for pneumonia. For uh, diarrhea, household or community-level water treatment, sustainable latrine options, and oral or transcutaneous vaccine development. And these are the conclusions. This is the last slide. So within the relatively short time frame, the research priorities were dominated by health systems and policy research topics. Examples were studying barriers to healthcare seeking, access, and increased coverage with available and cost-effective interventions, and studying scaling up of those interventions through community health workers. These were obviously followed by epidemiological questions, simple ones, to try to identify the main gaps in knowledge, like describing what works, what doesn't, and why. Then priorities for improvement of the existing interventions that were focused on training of community health workers, identifying cost reduction mechanisms, and improving the availability and uptake. And finally, among the new interventions, the greatest support was shown for the development of low-cost conjugate vaccines, cross-protective common protein vaccines, and non-liquid antibiotic formulations for pneumonia, and also for household and community-level water treatment and sustainable and affordable latrines for diarrhea. Thank you very much for